this is what we will talk about. Uh, the transformation of, of uh, how we work with the data and with the projects in, in uh, R&D at Click. And we will share a short story on how, how we transformed our, our way of working using data and using, using our, our gut feelings as well, of course. <coughs> and then we will share with you what we learned about the process and within the process. Yeah. So, um, if we go back uh, around yeah, three years ago, um, in the beginning of 2014, the R&D at uh, Click had two 250 engineers, and we had them uh, in different, like 15 to 20 different teams. We had two development developer sites, uh, a large one in Lund, and the second one was in Boston, a little bit smaller. Uh, at the time, we had two products. Uh, the one was the mature old product that was earning us money that we had in maintenance phase. And then we were uh, just about to launch a new product that will innovate the BI, self-service uh, um, self BI. Both of these project, the products were built on the monolithic architecture. And we has, have separated a pool of people working with we had one pool of people working with our product and the second pool of people working with two, the second product and at the time we was we were using tfs both for uh, source code um, handling and uh, also for bugs and if we fast forward to today we are around 500 engineers we have uh, 35 40 dev teams developing software we have around 10 infrastructure teams and other support teams. We have five developer development sites. We have six products. We have moved away from the monolithic architecture and moving over to microservice architecture-ish. We're not really there yet. We're working on it. And as you may, uh, may um, guess, we are trying to reuse our components to the multiple products. and. Also, this means that teams were working for different products now. So we are not separating our resource pool of people we have. We're trying to be clever about it. And we have uh, upgraded our uh, development uh, tools to Git and Artifactory. And in Jira, we have requirements and bugs. <laughs> so obviously, three years ago, it used to be easier to be project manager. By the way, this is really awkward. Anyway. <laughs> so uh, back then, I was leading more or less the same project I'm leading today. The, the big difference was that I probably knew 70% of people by name. And I knew a lot of people well enough to know that when they come screaming uh, wolf, it, it, is, there, is it a real wolf or is it just someone who's really edgy? And I kn knew where to go with the follow-up question. And at, at the time, my gut feeling could take me really far. And also, there was another thing, and this was that I've worked in Click for two and a half years by then. And my managers, my people who I was working with, they knew me. So they knew how accurate my gut feeling was. So now, looking back, it really feels an easy way to, to lead projects. But what happened is, as you see, we grew. Uh, the level, uh, the number of hierarchies have increased. We have, um, I was going to say adopted, but no, we hired a lot of experienced managers, which is really good for the company, but also they come with their own gut feeling. And their gut feeling is cultivated elsewhere in other circumstances, circumstances in other companies, in other cultures. And now when we were discussing problems, it was not necessarily so that our gut feelings were pointing in the same directions. And we needed something to tell us which, which, which is the right way to go. And also as a consequence of uh, uh, having a bigger organization, we needed to kind of s structure a little bit the way we would um, um, report progress and status. So we sat down and we were discussing um, what metrics could we actually 
pick out to tell us or tell us something about the state of R and D, and what data do we have? And I think we, we we took this this challenge with real eagerness, and I think a bit of blue. We were a little bit blue eyed and optimistic because it turned out not to be so straightforward. I don't think we understood that we will have to take several iterations until we hit the right metric. And I don't think we realized how many times we will kind of go off the path and have to get, come back. But this is a little bit story about that. And when we started on this kind of project to figure out how, what, how our metric ecosystem would look like, we started to read up and there is a lot of, a lot of literature about this. And um, I think a, a philosophy that we liked emerged in the process. And I think Yuan is hopefully going to tell us about that yes, now. I will. So as Nichara said, there's a lot of things to be read about measurements and metrics. And uh, after a while, we, we have developed our own view of it. So what I would like to, to share is our cornerstones uh, and, uh, and talk a little bit about them. <coughs> so, uh, as any mother and probably any father in the audience will recognize this picture. It's a growth chart for, uh, for an infant. Uh, I've chosen it because I think it represents measurements and metrics in a good way. Both the good things about metrics, but also the pitfalls that I think we should uh, try to stay away from. <coughs> so the first thing is me measure to understand. Never ever measure to, to, uh, to penalize or, or to, uh, to uh, reward. If you come in with your newborn one week and you don't follow this curve, so the idea is that you want to follow this, this curve with your baby. And if you come in one week and you don't do that, you won't be punished. You will probably punish yourself, and that's bad enough. But you won't get punished by the nurse. Neither will you be rewarded if you stay on curve. <coughs> and the same thing should go with, with metrics. If you choose to, for instance, measure bugs fixed every week, and you have set the target of 100, we want to fix 100 bugs every week, and you only fix 75 one week. You should, of course, take it in. You should analyze why it happened, but you shouldn't, you shouldn't punish anyone for, for, for it, uh, that it happened. <coughs> Next thing is stay away from comparing. Unless you are 100% certain what, that what you're comparing have the same prereqs, uh, there's no use comparing. As you know, all babies are different. They have different DNAs, they have di different home situations, and so on. Same with, with, uh, with your teams, if, if you're measuring teams. They are all different. They have different experience, they have different st skill sets, they have different tasks. They might be, even be on different continents of the world. So the only thing that comparison will lead to is anxiety. And uh, you know that comparing in this way, uh, it's, you always compare your, your child, even though you shouldn't. There's no use. <coughs> Third thing is own your metrics. Measure what's relevant to you. And it's only you that can define what's relevant to you. And in this case, we trust that the, the, the nurses and the doctors have come up with relevant measures to give a fairly good view of, of the baby's health and the baby's growth. And what might be good metrics for you? Well, you might get an idea in this talk, in the story we're about to, to tell. And if you're still curious and still want to hear more of what we use and what we think, a good metrics, feel free to, to come up and, and talk afterwards. Look for trends. As you will know, if you take a baby that's 10 week, weeks old and you just 
ask what it weighs, that tells you absolutely nothing. Because you have to know what the weight it was when it was born. And, and uh, the, the ratio and how much it has gained weight throughout the well, way. It's the same thing with the software development. Going back to that idea of, uh, of measuring bugs, and you have your target of 100 bugs every week. And you have uh, achieved that, you have a good trend of, of that, and one week you're only fixing 50. There's no use acting on that. Unless you should, of course, take it in. You should analyze why it happened. But there's no use acting until you see a trend in, the, in that declining that you maybe three weeks in a row start only fixing 50 bugs. Then it's time to act. <coughs> this is pretty obvious standing here today. Use data together with gut feeling. Since, since you're Seeing the, the nurse every week with your baby, and the, the nurse has tons of experience seeing hundreds and probably thousands of other parents with their babies, they will of course develop a gut feeling of, of the health of your baby. But she will probably not act on that alone. She will have this as a, as a support for her, for her acting. And in the other way around, if you have perfect metrics and still have this itching feeling in your stomach, it probably it's a wise thing to start poking around. If you, if you have your super duper trend, you're fixing more and more and more and more bugs every week. But you might see that at the end of every sprint, there's a lot of other activities starting to happen in the building. And people are getting grudgy and there's people running around and you see that that would probably get, give you a gut feeling. And I would say it's time to, to start poking around then. Don't stare blindly at the, this perfect trend that you have. <coughs> and lastly, there is no silver bullet. There's no perfect metric. As you see here, it, the first of it's three different metrics, but there's tons more that you use when it comes to babies. It's might be blood pressure, bone mass, reactions, and more and more and more to pick, give a picture of, of, of the baby's health. We need to remember that metrics are only proxies for what's really going on. And software development, again, it's the same thing. We will talk about code churn. That's one proxy. Uh, but there's a lot of other things that you need to take in consideration. Team happiness delivered features, uh, bug ratio, and so on and so on. And that will paint you a picture. You, can, you can't get that to just one single digit and one traffic light. Are we green this week or are we red this week? You can't do that. You need to take all the proxies in and then digest them. Yeah, so that's, that's the six main uh, Bullets we we have developed. There's, adopted, yeah, yeah, adopted. So uh, don't try to, to read this. This is just for uh, for me to point to something. Um, I don't need that. Um, so uh, I, in order for the story to make sense, I need to, to let you in on how we are work a little bit. I, I hope to do it very briefly. But as I said, there are several things. We, were, we started this Agile journey five years ago and we did many things and eventually we ended up with the Agile teams. And, and in our Agile teams, we want, of course, for the team to be owning their own destiny as much as they possibly can. We want them to own their own um, um, cadence of development, of release, etc., etc. So we want teams to, to, to decide by themselves if they want to sprint in two weeks or two, one week or three weeks, or if they want to do Kanban and whichever way they want to work. And, but remember, there are 35 development teams. Uh, we are still not out of the woods of dependencies between the teams, so some coordination needs to be done. It's getting better, we are not yet there. So we need to organize around something. 
we have to follow some kind of syncing mechanism in R&D. And for us, the syncing mechanism is milestone. And currently we're running 10 week long milestones. And in end of which every 10 week, there is a new version of our products that we can choose to either release externally or release as external beta or something else. But there is, there is a new version of the product coming out every 10 weeks. And this 10 week cadence is something that, that goes, comes back in several other um, activities we are doing. And also 10 week is a long period. So we have divided it into five, two week long, we call them beats. So what happens every 10 weeks is that we would get a um, revision of our priorities, pri priorities from the business. So product management will come to us and tell us, look, this is the priority list. It is almost the same as the last time. We have bumped this one thing up and we have removed this one thing. So this is, we don't see a huge amount of, of changes in this priority list exactly as how we would want it. We won't want that fairly stable, otherwise it, it becomes messy. This one is then input for entire R&D to sit down and, and to update their roadmaps. And all development teams, they have a roadmap that stretches for around a year. It's not a detailed plan because you cannot plan in detail so far. But it's more of an idea of these functionality we want to invest co co going forward. And of course, first, the closest five, ten weeks are much more detailed and more accurate the next milestone and next milestone and next milestone. And the last step in this uh, planning activities is the actually creating a plan for upcoming 10 weeks. In this case, uh, the teams would get their roadmap. Uh, they will get all the input they need. They will sync with other teams. They figure out how far they've gotten with things that are going on already in their pipelines. And they will create a 10 week plan. And this plan will contain how big amount, number of people, how m large amount will work with bug fixes, how many people will, will work with designing, early design of upcoming stuff, how many will deliver features into the products. So this is a very nice place for suddenly every 10 weeks we have pretty detailed plan for the entire R&D, which is like 500 people. But this is not the whole story. It does not give us the full picture because Oh, some of the uh, some features, if we are doing this properly, will end up in more than one product because this is what we are trying to do. We try to be smart. We, we develop it once and we reuse it twice, three times, etc. So for every product, we need to figure out which features will be delivered to my product, to my line, these ten weeks, and how the how does the risks look like. So it. This is a lot to take in. I can answer in any questions later, but I think I want to move on from this messy picture, actually. <laughs> so before we go further, I would like to talk about the risk a little bit. How many of you think about project risks on a daily basis? Come on, you must be thinking. My, my, my risk mitigation was actually sucked with this bus uh, anyway. I thought I had a really good margin, but it didn't really go well. Thank you for waiting, by the way. But anyway, so I, I'm thinking about risk because we are talking risk. And since I started as a project manager 13 is, years ago, it's all about the risk and risk mitigation. And then I tried, I was thinking, what is it we are trying to mitigate? So obviously we're trying to mitigate the risk that we won't be done in time with good quality. So that's the only thing we're trying to do. Remove obstacles so that you actually can deliver what you promised. And thinking about this, I realized that the risk is always connected to a deadline. Because if there is no deadline, if you have infinite amount of time to do what you're supposed to do, then there is the risk of you not making it is zero, right? Really nice. Um, and I think this is somehow this idea goes into the continuous deployment, continuous uh, delivery setup, which is something that we are aspiring to. So the risk in, in this setup is uh, uh, mitigated by delivering small portions of code often. The focus is 
that you that you are able to deliver new version of software with good quality and less focus that you actually hit a date with a set of features. And the reason why this works is because what it makes you do is that the next next re release is No, I get the brief. So the next release is coming up really soon. So even if you miss, uh, if you're about to miss a deadline, you're not tempted to deliver poor quality code because the train is, you know, next release is in maybe in a week or two weeks, and in our case, 10, 10, 10 weeks. So um, in theory, it works really well. In practice, we are getting there as well. We still have an occasional must-have. But the number of these are going down, and uh, the quality is going up, and the, the, the organization around us is actually trusting us that our uh, estimates are actually that they're becoming better at estimating stuff. So, what I do, this is my world. It's been my world for two and a half years. Every ten weeks, I would receive integration plan from R and D. Uh, my goal is to have something to deliver here of that is of really good quality. If it contains all the features, I don't really care. I want to be able to deliver here and not be ashamed, and so that none of us are ashamed, so that we can ship it to the customer, because this is what we have promised. So mitigating the risk. Integration plan consists of number of function, feature, new features that will come in. When they will come in? Will they come in in bit one or bit two? Or uh, what is their uh, complexity? Uh, of course, orange ones are more complex. So I'm together with the several teams that are working on a product level, trying to kind of get this done, get a plan, and then deliver something uh, 10 weeks later. And for, for what we use then to mitigate the risk or to, to at least know what a quality is, that we have a weekly uh, regression tests and uh, so we pick up a build every Friday, we do regression testing, and we know the quality. So it's basically figuring out what, what shape are we in. And then we have another interesting thing, which I particularly like because it's my tool that I work with, is um, it's our internal environment in which we actually use our product. Since we are selling the product as a business intelligence tool, tool for other companies to kind of keep track of their stuff, what we do is that we take a new version of our product every Friday and we upgrade and to our environment. And in this environment, I'm there three times a day and so are probably 100, 150 other people that they have apps that they use to run their day-to-day -day work with. So if, the, if this version of software is poor, we know very fast. Some things will disappear. We wouldn't be able to do stuff. You, you find the degrades very easily because you use it. So we have two different things that to kind of to figure out what our quality is. So the one is regression testing and the other is um, usage. And the thing is, this is amount of work we can do here is limited because even though that we, our automated test suite is increasing by the day, we still have some manual tests that we are running. And these manual tests are done by people, obviously. And there is the same amount of people every week. So if I have twice as many deliveries one week, we would do our regression testing, but the odds are that we won't cover everything because we can do just as much. We can try to be clever and do it smartly. But we would probably have some piece of a product that we have not really... We, we don't really know how did it change since last week. And we're left with uncertainty, and uncertainty is bad. It's much better to know that you have a shitty software here than not know, obviously. So... Um, we decided to, to try to, to measure this. What I want, what I want is the inflow of work to my integration branch to be uh, steady over the milestone, so that I know every time I've run my, my testing, I know. So in, 
doesn't matter if I figure out it's good or bad, but I know what it is and I know what to do next. So I want the, the code churn to be, so the code, when we talk about the code churn, we talk about number of lines of code that have been added or removed or changed. And there is a, I don't know, is it obvious why we use that? Yeah, so it's, uh, it seems to be pretty obvious, of course, but then again, you would argue if you don't change anything, you don't have a product. But the reason we use code churn or uh, deliveries uh, as a proxy for risk is, well, Microsoft did, did a uh, research back in 2006, and they could show a very clear connection between amount of code churn and the amount of bugs. And uh, this is also why Adam Thunhill in his book uh, Crime as Code Scene uses uh, change frequency as one big part of finding hotspots in the code. <coughs> so that's why we chose an uh, chosen code chain as a one of the proxies for risk, of course. Okay, so now I think we actually have set the stage for our story of code churn. So it was supposed to be theater. It was supposed to be improvisation theater in which you all should be part of, but that idea got uh, thumbs down from my colleagues. So it will be a little bit, I will tell you the story. Or anyone that wants to do improvisation theater? No, okay. So uh, back in 2014, uh, there was a planning session and the teams have planned and they have stored or should I say hidden their stuff on Confluence. We did not have this really nice uh, app that I have today, so I had to go dig, crawl through all these pages, and eventually I, I, I came up with a, this is what my integration plan looks like. I will have four, del four, uh, four uh, features in bit one, and then four features in bit two, and then six, and nine, and seven, and on top of that, these ones are risky business. That's why they're not delivering it in the f early on, because they need to fix it more. So this is all my, all my, all my kind of alarms go off on this. Uh, my stomach, I have to start eating Lusek and all that stuff. And I, I get my managers and I ask them, look guys, if I take a plan from Jira with all the features, this is how it looks like. There is a ski jump. We call this a ski jump, obviously. Uh, why, I think. Um, and then this guy, a young manager, looks at me and he tells me, nah, there'll be no code, there is no ski jump, it's, it's flat throughout the milestone. And I go look at this and I look at him and I say, how, how, how do you get there? And he says, well, you know, this continuous delivery stuff, we are doing it. So we are delivering code, all the milestone, and then we are done, we close the Jira item. And we close them in the end, so this is why it looks like this. But the actual deliveries of code, new code, changes of, in church, they are happening. Well, that's an, uh, yes, thinking about it, standing on my feet, trying to figure out, it makes sense. But I can't really let go of my feeling that things are not, it's not all the, the true, right? truth, right? So yeah, I'm, so, but I, I think, I think there is more activity in the end of the milestone than in the beginning. And they say, why? Why do you think that? And I say, well, we, we branch out and then we find lots of bugs. And then another guy says, or maybe it was a girl, but this is because we test differently on release branch. And I have to give her that, yes, we, we, we are not supposed to, but we are human, so we do and all that. So, but, but still, still, it's not, I, I, can't, I cannot really let it go because all the answers they, they're giving me are right, but my stomach says something is wrong here. So I go to Yuan, and Yuan, he makes, he makes these crazy, beautiful apps that I will come with the fuzzy, fuzzy idea. I cannot barely ver verbalize it, what I want, and he would give me an app. So I come to Yuan and ask, you know, uh, can we, I, I would like to know how many deliveries a week we are doing. Can you do that? Well, uh, would uh, merge pull requests to main, would that 
would that do? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's deliveries. So we go for that. So he goes off and he does his magic and ta-da. So we pull a data out of Git and what do you see? <laughs> and I call back my managers. So I'm peer with my managers. I, 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 or not even peer, I'm on a side trying to do stuff. So they come and they look at this and I say, ha ha, look. There is a ski jump. And th they look at it and so what are we looking at? And then I explain, well, this is the number of deliveries this week. This is the boundary. This is where we branch off. This is delivery every week. This is average size of the pull request. And they sit and they look and they think and they say, but of course, you know this continuous delivery thing? We are doing it. We try to be clever, so towards the end of the milestone, we would deliver smaller but more often, as to mitigate the risk. So this is just what you, you would be expecting uh, to see, if we are behaving properly. And of course, yes, that, it, that, it, it does make sense, but I still cannot really let go of this. So I, of course, go back to Johan and I say, can we somehow make this more clear? Sure. How about total lines of, of changed? Total lines. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. How about seeing all the file changes? To total number of line lines change. change. Yes. Will that work for you? Yes, it will work beautifully. And then we get this. So the above is the same. It's number of deliveries per week. It's like maybe 20, 25 tips deli de delivering. It's many deliveries. And here you can see how many lines of code aggregated. So for all these deliveries, it was actually this little code, right? It looked, it, it was just as what they said, but it's not flat, I must say. And, and I, I, I asked them back. <laughs> uh, and I showed them this and I say, well, it's not a ski jump, not always at least. But I would say that second half of the milestone receives more delivery, uh, more code churn than the first one. And then this girl, uh, uh, this woman asks me, but what code are you looking at? Are you looking at all code? Um, I'm looking at certain Git and, and she says, well, we have a lot of test code in there. So maybe it's actually our test code deliveries that are spiking here. Here one. Yeah, so this is what we have. We separated the test code from the product code. We take a look at this and we see, yes, these spikes are actually in the test code. Something was going on there. And <laughs> the, the culture is actually more or less flat, except for this, who I went off and found out what it was, I can't remember anymore. But it, it, these type of things usually end up in me running around in an organization. But anyway, so my gut feeling was actually wrong here. But what happened along this, in this process, and you can see this has taken time, this is not something that we did in a week. We had repeated conversations with, with managers and, and we kind of aligned what we can read out from this. So next time I showed this, everyone knew what we were talking about. We did not have to negotiate what shows what and what does it mean. And once we made an up out of it, it belongs to everyone. So any team could, I don't care comparing teams because I don't actually, in all honesty, I don't care. Only thing I care is that they don't mess up my master. So if they deliver this much or that much, they have their line managers, they're supposed to work with their ways of working, et cetera, et cetera. But if they want, they could actually uh, drill down and look how their behavior for their specific team looks like. They could actually use it as um, part of a retrospect. They could say, our goal is to, within uh, next, next sprint, uh, deliver no larger than this and deliver so many deliveries a week. And then they can kind of target that. And this is easy, very easy to, to get. For me, it became a see a spike run around kind of exercise. Because 
when I saw this, I know something actually happened and I could easily figure out which team because I can look in my app and I can see who did this. And then I can go and I can talk to them. And mo most often it's nothing. There is a good explanation for it. Sometimes it's maybe they didn't really think and then we figure out how we can mitigate it. But it is really excellent tool for me rather than coming and say, I have this feeling, I was looking at my crystal ball, it doesn't really look like right. What can we do about it? This becomes a really nice tool. Next, I think. So before this summer, this year, it was really good times because we have finally, for my job and in different areas as well, we have landed on ecosystem of metrics that were actually quite good. And it was a prediction on when things, uh, if things are delayed, when they will come in. Some data from Jira, my, my beat plan and how it changed week, uh, beat over beat when things were delayed. I had, you can see we are delivering much more now, but actually the size of the delivery is going down. So my daily routine would be I come to work, I take a look at this one, and if I look for something that's not doesn't look right. And when I see that, then I go and talk to people. It, partly it's very nice to talk to people, and partly we are, every time we talk, we are aligning. We are aligning about our um, values, how do we want to work, what's, what's working, what's not, etc., etc., which is really nice. And also this dashboard let me explore stuff and, and exploring is really fun. Yeah. So I had this, this spike coming up close to the border of Milestone and when I, and I looked at it, it, found, it turns out it's a team that's really in the core of the product and if they do this big change, any, anything can happen more or less. So they are on the fourth floor, I ran up panting without the breath uh, and they see me and they know exactly why I'm there. They just start laughing and it's like, no, 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 we just change tabs to spaces. Well, is there, can that mess up something? No, can't mess up anything. Are you sure? No, no, but it just tabs to spaces. It's, well, it did mess up stuff. Not, not, not this particular change, which was huge, but they actually sneaked in something else that they kind of forgot to tell about. And that, that kind of burst later on and we had to run around and fix stuff. But then also it was really nice to see that we were actually making progress to this uh, journey we were on, which was to actually break out stuff from the monolith. So this one was a client leaving monolith and then we had some performance tests leaving and then there was vacation and then there was, and then we came back. We're not really done yet, but I want to share to you with you a little bit about what the method that kind of emerged. And it was nothing that we sit down and we will have this scientific method, this is how we will work. It just, we, we started doing it and, and then we noticed that the same pattern is appearing every time. So it always starts with a question. A manager or anyone actually posing a question that everyone goes like this, yeah, that's a good question. How can we figure it out? Or which is in my case often, I made an assumption and people challenge it and then I have to uh, prove it. But the next step would be that, yeah, well, you go talk to people, I find three guys that will give me the answer and then I, I listen to them, I ask some questions, I put in some gut feelings, I mix it a little bit, extrapolate, interpret, and then there is a narrative in PowerPoint. There is a lot of, way, a lot of steps here where, where information can be added or removed, so the question is how accurate it is. But anyway, after three or four weeks when I'm posing the same question to the same people and they really start to get annoyed with me, we are thinking about how can we, can we get this data from somewhere in the system? Can we add, maybe there is, the answer is in Git already. Maybe we need to add a new field in Jira that we can fill in, which is not popular either, but anyway. Uh, so that we can pull out this data. And once we, once we figure out where in data the answer to the question lies, then we can actually uh, dump it into Excel. And suddenly, it's not just me talking to three people, but it's me and anyone who wants to discuss the metric and the result. And once we figure out that this is actually something we, 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 that we would like to keep, this is a good question, so there is a good answer in this data, we should continue looking at it. 
we go to the app master and then we get an app. And having an app, oh, I shouldn't read. <laughs> I think I'm completely, sorry. Uh, so, and when you have an app, then it's, the data is always live. You don't have to dump stuff in Excel and do pivoting and all that. But the other thing is, when you have it in the app, you can ask other questions because all data is there. It's just how you frame your question. So uh, there is a lot of exploring and good stuff going on. And when you have data, you start to interpret it. And sometimes you get data and it's, you go like, what, why? Why does it look like this? So I will tell you a very short story, or we will. So this was a, for a quite a while, this was really a question that was, I was stretching my head over because we have, a, this is the, this is the number of open bugs we have in our product. And it went down and then just plateaued. And it, unfortunately, it plateaued on a level that was too, too high for us to be comfortable with. So we were discussing what to do and we said, well, of course, let's, um, let's put more people to fixing bugs, which we did. One milestone, nothing happens. Two milestones, nothing happens. We, we add more people to bug fixing, nothing happens. And I'm like starting to speculate and get really paranoid. paranoid. It's like I went to you and I said, I don't get this. I, I don't get this because we are doing all these things and nothing is happening. Are people lying? Are they doing something else and not fixing bugs? So, so my question is, what do we see here? The blue bars, what are that? Those? Um, open bugs. So they are open bugs. Yeah. So what are all the other states a bug can be in? Aren't that relevant? I mean, you have new bugs which aren't committed and you have fixed bugs. Why are we, I mean, we don't know what's lying behind this, do we? No, so, yeah, so, yeah, we can. It took me probably the better part of 30 seconds to add a dimension. <laughs> so, uh, we got, got a chart that looked like this, where you see here the blue bars are the open bugs. The red bars are the new bugs, uh, that milestone. And the green bars are the fixed bugs, that milestone. So, what you can see, the problem becomes pretty obvious. We're fixing like madmans and we're keeping our nose just above the water because we're adding just as many bugs as we're fixing. And that was made in, yeah, as I said, probably took about 30 seconds to just add a dimension to, to the data and bring pretty good clarity in what we're actually doing. And of course, this insight in turn had us rethink our strategy. So adding more people, uh, in the end, we would just everyone would be fixing bugs. So something else needed to be done and we s strategized a little bit and uh, tweaked some stuff higher up in uh, the pro develop, uh, software development process. And they're slowly starting to go down. So I have no stories, no more stories. Well, we have a lot of stories, but there is no time and you will get bored eventually. But what did we learn? So as you see in the previous example, one metric is not enough. You need to, you, one data point is really bad. One metrics, even if it's a trend, is not good enough. You need to actually have several metrics that will give you pulse on different things so that you can get a little bit bigger picture. Well, trends are better than KPIs, I said that. And combine these always with talking to people because data is only data. It's, there, there comes a lot of good stuff with talking uh, with people, mostly clarity actually, and not always. And then use your metrics to understand the system because if you go to any company and you ask them how the product looks like, what's the architecture, they will give you a PowerPoint and you will look at it. And once you start working with it, you will see strange behavior that actually points that the system does not really look like as in PowerPoint. And Using metrics to understand system better will also help you improve it, maybe in smaller, less painful increments, I think. And also another thing we noticed is that this, this is really the dashboard, your ecosystem of metrics, it's, it's so addictive. You have it there. It's your snutefield, English, the ba baby blanket, yeah, and you know, the one that you feel cozy and safe with. You c I come in the morning, it's there, I see it. 
and then we reorganize or we change a tool and suddenly I, I don't see anything anymore. It feels like really driving in with, with your eyes closed. So we're now we're actually starting to think about these things, but we, when we need, uh, how long can we be without visuals when we, we, when we change a tool or when we reorganize and change names on everything in Jira, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. So um, this is pretty much it. The closing words is, it is fun, go explore your data. So the question is for you is only what data do you have that complement your gut feeling to, to drive your business forward? <laughs>